You're listening to the free, ad-sponsored re-release of American Elections Wicked Game, a weekly march through every presidential election from 1789 to 2024. To listen to all episodes right now, ad-free, go to IntoHistory.com. Subscribers there enjoy ad-free listening, early access, bonus content, and more from a growing collection of great history podcasts. Start your free trial today at IntoHistory.com. It's February 24th, 1841. The Supreme Court is packed with spectators who've come to hear what would become a notorious case, United States v. Schooner Amistad. Order, order. I said order. The court must decide the future of 36 souls, primarily Mendy West Africans who were illegally captured and taken to Cuba by Spanish slave traders. During their voyage, the West Africans revolted against their captors and commandeered the ship. But as they tried to sail home to Africa, they were captured by U.S. authorities. Now, the highest court in America must decide their fate. The judge turns to the West African's attorney and gives him the floor. Mr. Adams, you may proceed. That's former President John Quincy Adams, son of America's second president. While half the room reveres him, the other half are ready to burn him in effigy for his abolitionist views. Adams addresses the room. May it please your honors. I will have order in this chamber, gentlemen. Justice Story glares out across the audience. Another word out of you lot, and I will clear this courtroom. Proceed, Mr. Adams. Thank you, your honor. Adams takes a breath, the weight of the moment clearly working on him. He's spoken in the court before, but never for a cause such as this. He hopes his age will not betray his passion. This court is a court of justice. I ask the court to consider what justice is. The constant and perpetual will to secure to everyone his own right. I appear here on behalf of 36 individuals whose life and liberty depend on the decision of this court. In defense of the West Africans, Adams doesn't hold back. He launches a pointed attack against his political rival, outgoing President Martin Van Buren. Van Buren had tried to send the West Africans to Spain, hoping to win Southern support in the 1840 contest, but Van Buren lost the election. And today, Adams is putting his presidency on trial. Is it possible that a president should be ignorant that the right of personal liberty is individual? That no greater violation of his official oath to protect and defend the Constitution could be committed than to seize and deliver up at a foreign minister's demand these 36 persons. That he was ignorant of this truth is willful and corrupt perjury to his official presidential oath. Your Honors, there is a principle on which a particular decision is demanded from this court. Adams points to a framed document hanging on the wall of the courtroom, the Declaration of Independence. That document says every man is endowed by his creator with certain inalienable rights. The right of slavery is utterly incompatible with any theory of human rights, and especially with the rights which the Declaration of Independence proclaims as self-evident truths. The moment you come to the Declaration of Independence that every man has a right to life and liberty, this case is decided. Order, order. Thanks to John Quincy Adams' skill in the courtroom, the West Africans were set free. The Amistad case of 1841 would become a rallying cry for the burgeoning cause of abolition and a dire warning to Southern interests who wanted to safeguard their peculiar institution. The issue of slavery would define the 1844 election and push the country ever closer to the brink of civil war. From Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Elections Wicked Game. The election of 1840 taught Martin Van Buren a valuable lesson. The old way of winning elections no longer worked. 
Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and indeed every president, including Van Buren, refrained from openly campaigning. Over the years, even as political parties became more sophisticated, presidential campaigns were largely waged by supporters of the candidates, in the press and behind closed doors. But in the 1840 contest, William Henry Harrison changed everything. He was the first president to openly campaign for the office and the first to launch an official campaign tour. In part because of his aggressive campaign, Harrison won the 1840 contest in a staggering electoral landslide, beating Van Buren handily and denying him a second term. But Harrison's presidency was short-lived. One month after his inauguration, Old Tip, as he was called, became the first president to die in office, succumbing to an illness he contracted soon after his inauguration. Harrison's untimely death tested the Constitution and created a power struggle inside the executive branch. For the first time in American history, the power of the presidency was handed to a vice president, John Tyler of Virginia, America's first accidental president. This is episode 15, 1844, Clay versus Polk, His Accidency. It's April 6th, 1841, in the presidential office of the White House, and President Harrison's cabinet has assembled for an emergency meeting. Two short days ago, President Harrison died of pneumonia, leaving the country without a president and the cabinet in a state of panic. Daniel Webster, Harrison's secretary of state, does his best to calm the room. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there's no need to worry. I have assurances from the acting president that all of our positions are secure, and I am sure he will say as much when he arrives. A president has never died in office before. Every action creates precedent and tests the untested constitutional clause of succession. The men in Harrison's cabinet, like many in Washington, are racked with anxiety and uncertainty. And just then, the door opens. Walking in is acting president John Tyler of Virginia. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Sorry for the delay. As you can imagine, it's been quite the ordeal this morning. Just yesterday, Vice President Tyler was back home in Virginia when news of Harrison's death reached him. He immediately left for the Capitol by steamboat and earlier this morning was sworn in at Brown's Hotel as acting president. Please, gentlemen, sit. I hope this is a suitable location for us to meet. Yes, sir. It was our usual practice to hold conference here in Mr. Harrison's office. In my office. I beg your pardon, sir? My office. It is now my office, is it not? Webster is at a loss for words. Before he can muster a reply, Tyler presses the point. You see, Mr. Webster, do you think it proper to do business elsewhere for the remaining three years and 11 months of my term? Uh, no, no, sir. Good, then it's settled. Webster and the rest of the cabinet are listless. They had planned out an extensive presidential agenda with Harrison and the Whig Party leader, Senator Henry Clay. Now those plans might be out the window. Democrats in Washington are already challenging Tyler's authority as acting president. And now, ironically, the president's very own Whig cabinet is questioning it too. Now, on to more pressing matters. I have drafted a few policies that I think will do well by the country. Mr. Acting President, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but... Before we hear any new policy requests, don't you think it would be prudent to... Policy requests? <laughs> to whom must I make a request to draft executive policy? I am the president, after all. Acting president, sir. Secretary Webster. Gentlemen. First and foremost, I will be addressed from this point forward as president, not vice president, and not acting president. President. And as far as policy is concerned, I ask you to remain in this cabinet to provide the nation with a tranquil transition, not to administer the country in my place. Not, not in your place, sir, but in conjunction with you by committee. Our custom was that all measures, whatever, however, relating to the administration were brought before the cabinet, and their settlement was decided by a majority, each member and the president having one vote. I have one vote, as, as each of us will have. This is absurd. I'm the president, acting president. Tyler stews at Webster's defiance. In this very moment, precedent is being established, and Tyler knows it. His only course is to fight for his legitimacy. I beg your pardon, gentlemen. I am sure I am very glad to have in my cabinet such able statesmen as you have proved yourself to be, and I shall be pleased to avail myself of your counsel and advice, but I can never consent to being dictated to as to what I shall or shall not do. I, as president, 
will be responsible for my administration. When you think otherwise, your resignations will be accepted. After the death of President Harrison, perhaps the most important precedent set was what happened to the office of the presidency. Article 2, Section 6 of the Constitution accounts for presidential vacancies, but the language is ambiguous. In case of the removal of the president from office, or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president, and the Congress may by law provide for the case of removal, death, resignation, or inability, both of the president and vice president, declaring what officer shall then act as president, and such officer shall act accordingly, until the disability be removed or a president shall be elected. From the language of the Constitution, it was obvious to most that the vice president would serve as president until a new president could be elected. But the question was, for how long? Did the vice president then serve as acting president only until a special election could be held for president? Or was the vice president now president with all powers thereof for the remainder of the term? In John Tyler's mind, there was no doubt where he stood on the matter. With Harrison dead, Tyler was the president in every sense of the word, and he would act accordingly. But there was another question on the mind of the Washington establishment. Who was John Tyler, and what kind of president would he be? John Tyler Jr. was the very definition of a Southern gentleman. Born March 19, 1790, in a gilded plantation in Virginia, Tyler was born of privilege. His father had been the governor of Virginia and a close personal friend and college roommate to Thomas Jefferson. Both John Tyler Sr. and Vice President Tyler had shaped their political views after Jefferson. John Tyler Jr. had graduated in 1807 and went on to work in the Richmond Law Office of Edmund Randolph, who served as George Washington's attorney general. Tyler had increased his already large fortune when he married Letitia Christian, the daughter of another wealthy plantation owner, and began a career in politics. Tyler had been a staunch supporter of Andrew Jackson in the 1828 election, but over the years, the two men had parted ways. During Jackson's presidency, Tyler had increasingly come to see Jackson as authoritarian, rapidly expanding the powers of the presidency and trampling on the rights of states. It was during the nullification crisis of 1832 that Jackson's threat of federal force against insubordinate states had finally ended Tyler's support of Old Hickory. When Henry Clay formed the Whig Party to oppose the Jacksonian Democrats, Tyler had switched parties, abandoning the Democrats in favor of the Whigs. But Henry Clay and John Tyler did not see eye to eye on every issue. Clay was largely in favor of the federal government taking an active role in controlling the economy of the country through a strong national bank. Tyler opposed such policies, believing adamantly in the individual state's authority and autonomy. But Clay and Tyler had found common cause in their opposition to Jackson. So when Clay pushed Congress to censure Jackson, Tyler had supported the measure. He felt so strongly about Jackson's need for censure that when his home state of Virginia voted to force him to remove the censure, Tyler had resigned his Senate seat in protest. Tyler's opposition to Jackson had earned him the respect of many prominent Whigs, men like Henry Clay. Those same Whigs put Tyler on the Harrison ticket in 1840, hoping Tyler's presence would boost Harrison's prospects in the South and ultimately hand him the 1840 election. They were right. Harrison won. But for the Whigs, Vice President Tyler was one thing. President Tyler was another. From the very beginning of Tyler's accidental presidency, Henry Clay and others in control of the Whig Party encouraged Tyler to relinquish control to the cabinet, men who were loyal to the Whig Party platform. Traditionally, all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, presidential cabinets had held a great deal of power and authority. It was Andrew Jackson, the very man Tyler despised so much, that strengthened presidential authority and often opposed his own cabinet. This put Tyler in a dilemma. Does he cede control to his cabinet and party leadership or emulate Jackson, the man he loathed? Tyler chose to cement his own authority. He would not be subservient to the cabinet or the political whims of Henry Clay and the Whigs. In his inaugural address, Tyler gave what he called a brief exposition of the principles which will govern me in the general course of my administration. The very assertion that it was his administration was excoriated in the press. 
In the House of Representatives, a motion was called to force upon Tyler the title of vice president now exercising the duties of president. Though the motion failed, it was clear that no one considered Tyler the president except for Tyler. And after the attempted mutiny at his first cabinet meeting on April 6, 1841, President Tyler set out to seize the reins of power and prove his legitimacy. It would be a hard-fought battle on multiple fronts. Tyler's political enemies called him his accidency and refused to obey his orders. Many challenged the language of Article II and only referred to Tyler as acting president. Others went to work trying to establish a special election for a new president. Former President John Quincy Adams called Tyler's assertion of presidential power a direct violation of both the grammar and context of the Constitution. Still, Tyler would not relent. He entirely refused to answer to the title of acting president and even had an all-male address to the acting president return to sender. If anyone wanted to do business with the White House, it would be on his terms or there would be no business at all. In the end, Tyler's stubbornness won the day. His actions established the precedent that vice presidents would serve out the full term of their predecessor. Tyler would later write, If the tide of defamation abuse shall turn, and my administration come to be praised, future vice presidents who may succeed to the presidency may feel some slight encouragement to pursue an independent course. On June 1, 1841, the debate over Tyler's authority was settled when Congress passed a resolution solidifying Tyler's legacy as the 10th President of the United States. But Tyler's legacy was anything but a foregone conclusion. Tyler wanted to be more than an accidental president. He wanted to be legitimately elected for the office in the upcoming election of 1844. However, his struggle for presidential power made that dream all but impossible. His exertions to establish his own authority cost him his standing with the Whig Party and put him in direct conflict with the very man who had put Tyler in office to begin with, Senator Henry Clay. It's June 1841 at the White House. Kentucky Senator Henry Clay arrives outside the door to President John Tyler's office. He pauses for a moment to gather his wits. He's about to pitch John Tyler a controversial idea, a third national bank. He takes a deep breath and knocks on the door. Senator Clay, welcome. Come in. Close the door behind you. Clay and the Whigs have been fighting for a national bank since Andrew Jackson destroyed the second national bank in 1836. With the loyal President Harrison dead, he'll have to try and sell Tyler on the idea. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Vice President. Mr. President, sir. As you know, Congress has made it official. Yes, of course. Pardon the offense, Mr. President. It just takes some time getting used to. I promise in time. I've now been president a week longer than President Harrison was at his passing. It is my hope that the question of titles is settled once and for all. Again, my apologies. In fact, Mr. President, it is your ascendancy to this office which brings me here today. His goal in mind, Clay turns on the charm and tries a little flattery. I wish you to know, Mr. President, I believe you have the ability to equal your predecessor, and I believe you are a true friend to his cause. My administration was elected on Whig principles, and I will hold true to those ideals. Clay bristles at the words, my administration. But Tyler is in the White House, and if Clay hopes to create a national bank, he must convince Tyler, a man with a pension for states' rights. Clay walks a delicate line. I have no doubt you will carry out the policies of the Whigs, Mr. President. I believe, or, or rather I should say, I hope you will interpose no obstacle to the success of the Whig measures, especially those surrounding the question of the bank. I have no qualms about establishing the bank, Mr. Clay. This is music to my ears, Mr. President. In Washington. Sir? Congress has the authority to act at the local level in the District of Columbia. They may charter a bank here if it pleases them. Outside of Washington, I would think the Constitution leaves further branching of the bank to the wishes of the states. Mr. President, without the power to create branches in other states, it will be difficult to attract additional investors. The bank would be insolvent. The states have the right to deny the branching of the bank if they so choose. And I will veto any bill that says otherwise. You would go against the Whigs and veto such a necessary bill, one drafted by members of your own cabinet. There's a word to describe that sort of behavior, sir. Jacksonian. Tyler slaps his hand on his desk and roars. 
I will have you know, I supported Jackson's veto of your second bank, and I will do so to your third, fourth, fifth, and so on. It goes against the Tenth Amendment. You are in full embrace of nullification, you, the acting president? The president, Mr. Clay. Tyler stands and points toward the Capitol building. Now understand this, Senator. Though you and I were born in the same district, have fed upon the same food and breathed the same air, we will never agree on this issue. Tyler angrily marches to his office door and flings it open. As Clay heads for the exit, Tyler roars. Go now, Mr. Clay, to your end of the avenue and there perform your duty to the country as you think proper. So help me God, I shall do mine at this end of it as I think proper. Good day, sir. At a cabinet meeting on August 7th, 1841, President Tyler was presented a bill to establish a new national bank. Nine days later, he made good on his threat and vetoed the bill. His cabinet, many of whom had helped author the bill, were beside themselves. The centerpiece of Henry Clay's agenda, a third national bank, was dead. The Democrats were overjoyed, the Whigs despondent, but determined to fight back. After his veto of the bank bill, a mob of angry Whigs marched on the White House. The posse threw rocks at the windows, fired guns into the air, and hanged John Tyler in effigy from a nearby tree. The first lady, who had suffered a stroke in 1839 and was limited to living upstairs in the executive mansion, feared for her life. Tyler was left to fear for his political future. His stubborn refusal to play ball with the Whigs cost him. Whigs in Congress turned their backs on Tyler, and the resistance didn't stop with the legislative branch. On September 11, 1841, at the urging of Henry Clay, every member of Tyler's cabinet resigned in protest, save one, his Secretary of State, Daniel Webster, ironically the very man who had first led the cabinet in opposition against him. Tyler was furious. Henry Clay is a doomed man, he proclaimed. But Clay didn't see it that way. Clay saw an opportunity to deny John Tyler his party's nomination and win the presidency for himself. On March 31, 1842, Clay resigned his seat from the Senate to begin positioning himself for a presidential run in the 1844 election. Estranged from his party and under attack from Henry Clay, Tyler felt isolated. Adding to his feelings of loneliness, his wife Letitia suffered a second stroke and died on September 10, 1842. It was the first time in U.S. history a First Lady died in the White House. Tyler was emotionally devastated, and he was politically vulnerable. He had few allies and even fewer friends. Sensing weakness, Henry Clay went on the attack. Clay knew that as long as Tyler was in office, the Whigs' legislative agenda would end in veto. They did not have the two-thirds majority to override him. If the Whigs were to hold the reins of Washington, Tyler would have to go. So in January of 1843, Clay spearheaded an attempt to impeach and remove Tyler from office. The impeachment vote failed, but Clay was just getting started. Since he could not remove Tyler, he sought to make the office of the president irrelevant. Clay led an effort to change the threshold of overriding a veto from a supermajority of two-thirds to just a simple majority. This attempt to cut Tyler off at the knees also failed, and not long after, Henry Clay abandoned his crusade against Tyler's presidency, instead focusing his efforts on winning his party's nomination in the election of 1844. Tyler's time in the White House was largely defined by one issue, westward expansion. The untamed West was a land of opportunity. Decades of explorers, fur traders, and missionaries had slowly established trails and outposts that connected the United States to its territories, disputed claims, and neighbor Mexico to the West. In May of 1843, nearly 1,000 people left Independence, Missouri to follow quite literally in the paths of earlier Americans to settle in the Oregon country. This marked the beginning of the long and dangerous process of westward migration. The country was growing, and it was only a matter of time before new states would be added to the Union. This aggressive expansion also brought to the forefront of national politics an issue it had managed to avoid for decades, slavery. The trial of the Amistad had stirred the passions of both abolitionists and defenders of slavery alike. Up until the summer of 1843, Congress had managed to skirt the subject of slavery entirely. 
Henry Clay had led the effort to sideline the debate on slavery back in 1820 when he proposed the Missouri Compromise, an agreement that all lands in the Louisiana Purchase north of the 36th degree, 32nd parallel, would be free states, while those south of the line would allow slavery. In December of 1835, in order to maintain that peace, the U.S. House of Representatives had instituted the gag rule, forbidding the House from considering anti-slavery petitions. These steps were merely efforts to delay the inevitable. Neither the Missouri Compromise or the gag rule tackled the issue directly. The nation was split, deeply, and held together by the most fragile of bonds. In 1843, those bonds strained to breaking, when the Republic of Texas, which had just won its independence from Mexico, expressed an interest in joining the United States. In June of 1843, John Tyler was desperate to legitimize himself in the minds of the people. As he learned from Thomas Jefferson's Louisiana Purchase, nothing solidified a presidential legacy like expansion. So he turned his focus toward annexing Texas. He found an ally in another former vice president, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. Calhoun was a states' rights advocate, pro-slavery like Tyler, and he would become one of Tyler's closest advisors. In July of 43, Tyler discovered a plot by the British to loan money to Texas if they would emancipate their slaves. Tyler would not stand for British interference in affairs on the North American continent, especially over slavery. Tyler began secret negotiations with Isaac Van Zant, the Texas minister to the United States, for the annexation of Texas. But on August 23, 1843, Mexican President Antonio López de Santa Ana threw a wrench in Tyler's plans. Mexico did not recognize the independence of Texas. Santa Ana warned that if the United States tried to annex Texas, Mexico would view that action as the U.S. stealing Mexican territory. It would be considered an act of war, and Mexico would answer with force. As the election of 1844 approached, the incumbent Tyler found himself without a party. He was all but banished from the Whigs, and he knew he would not be their candidate. But this only further motivated Tyler to pursue the annexation of Texas. If he accomplished the annexation, he might be able to earn enough popular support to either run as a Democrat or as a third-party candidate. Undeterred by threats from Mexico, on April 12, 1844, Tyler was successful in signing with Texas the Tyler-Texas Treaty. It promised to annex Texas into the Union as a territory as soon as the treaty was approved by Congress. In trade for Texas ceding all its public lands to the United States, the federal government would assume up to $10 million of Texas's debt. The treaty also left open the exact boundaries of Texas and whether the republic would be broken into smaller states. On April 22nd, Tyler submitted this treaty to the Senate, where its approval required a two-thirds majority vote. Calhoun and Tyler plotted to use the issue to build public consensus among pro-slavery Democrats and Whigs. First, Calhoun sent a letter denouncing Britain's anti-slavery meddling in Texas to the British minister. The intent of the letter was to win support for the treaty from Southern congressmen, who would be angered at Britain's interference. But when Calhoun's letter and the terms of the treaty were leaked to the press, the public became convinced the sole reasoning for annexing Texas was the expansion of slavery. No one could avoid the issue now. A vote for Texas was a vote for Tyler, which was a vote for slavery. The election of 1844 had become a referendum on America's most brutal and shameful institution. On May 1, 1844, the Whigs held their convention in Baltimore, Maryland. Henry Clay, who had been quietly campaigning for almost two years, won the nomination with little resistance. But there was a question that loomed over the convention. Texas. Whigs in the North feared annexing Texas would give more congressional power to slave states. Though Clay himself was a slaveholder, he and the rest of the Southern Whigs did not want to upset the delicate balance between the North and South. Southern Whigs committed to put party loyalty above the expansion of slavery. With a strong consensus, the Whig Party adopted an anti-Texas annexation policy. That same month, the opposition party gathered in Baltimore for the Democratic Convention. Former President Martin Van Buren walked into the convention the clear frontrunner. In fact, he and Henry Clay had made a gentleman's agreement to stand against the annexation of Texas in their public remarks. Van Buren and Clay were worried about the same thing. The issue of Texas, and therefore slavery, 
might spark sectional conflict, not to mention war with Mexico. But when Van Buren voiced his strict anti-annexation stance at the convention, members of the Democratic Party pushed back. They abandoned the little magician, as Van Buren was called, and began looking for a new candidate. It's Tuesday, May 28, 1844, at a local tavern in Baltimore, Maryland. It's almost midnight, but the streets are bustling. The Democratic National Convention is in full swing, and the hotels and taverns near Monument Square are filled with delegates. In a private room in the back of the tavern, three Democratic delegates meet in secret, George Bancroft and Marcus Morton of Massachusetts and Gideon Pillow of Tennessee. As they sip their drinks, Mr. Morton leans in and whispers, is there any hope to save Mr. Van Buren's nomination? Dejected, Mr. Bancroft shakes his head, no. I'm afraid not, Mr. Morton. The party wants to annex Texas. Come tomorrow, I suspect the convention will settle on Senator Cass of Michigan. He's been gaining ground since the convention started. Lord help us. Cass doesn't stand a chance in the election. I agree. Can we rally the convention to Mr. Van Buren's side? After he made his views on Texas known? No. If only there was someone who could unite the party. Well, there is. And who might that be, Mr. Pillow? Pillow stands, heads to the entrance of the private room, and closes the door. James K. Polk. Bancroft and Morton share a skeptical look. Speaker Polk? He just lost the governor's race in Tennessee for the second time. By a small margin, Mr. Morton, less than 4,000 votes. His own people hardly support him. Old Hickory does. Mr. Jackson's days are numbered, as is his influence over the people. I did not come to Baltimore to hear you give insult to Mr. Jackson. Mr. Morton and I did not come to Baltimore to support Mr. Polk. We came to support Mr. Van Buren. Mr. Van Buren's a vessel that is sinking, gentlemen. Will you go down with the ship? You truly believe Polk can win? If Massachusetts supports Mr. Polk, the rest of the states will follow suit. But none of it will matter if Polk can't win the election. I tell you, public support is behind annexation. So is Polk. Henry Clay has abandoned his Kentucky values. The Southern Whigs are ready to abandon him. Morton and Bancroft exchange another glance. Well, you certainly have our attention, Mr. Pillow. Only one question. If we follow this course, what will become of our friend Mr. Van Buren? Well, I suppose he'll have to find another line of work. After losing in 1840, Martin Van Buren wanted nothing more than to take back the White House. But on the evening of Tuesday, May 28th, the second day of the Democratic National Convention, three delegates changed the course of American history and deprived Van Buren of chasing a second term. After eight ballots, the Democratic Party selected the nation's first dark horse candidate, the little-known former House Speaker James K. Polk of Tennessee. George M. Dallas, a lawyer from Pennsylvania, was chosen as his vice presidential candidate. The Whigs immediately mocked Polk's status as a political nobody and made their presidential campaign slogan, Who is James K. Polk? Polk was a lawyer from Tennessee and had more experience than the Whigs gave him credit for. He had served as a congressman for 14 years, the speaker for four, and had been the governor of Tennessee. He was labeled Young Hickory because he was a protege of Andrew Jackson, who supported the annexation of Texas. In Polk's mind, Texas already belonged to the U.S. The issue of annexation was the centerpiece of Polk's campaign, but it would also be the centerpiece of President John Tyler's campaign, who was strongly considering a third-party run at the White House. But of all people, his nemesis, Andrew Jackson, convinced Tyler to back off and throw his support behind Polk. During the campaign, Henry Clay did his best to sidestep the issue of annexation. He was walking a delicate line, trying to keep the Whigs united. The less he said, the better. But on June 8, 1844, President Tyler pressed the issue when he tried to push through the Texas Annexation Treaty. The treaty itself failed, but it succeeded in putting Texas and slavery on the ballot. A majority of the country wanted to annex Texas, and Clay knew it, but he could not embrace that position while also appeasing the northern anti-slavery faction of his own party. In the end, fearing annexation, many northern Whigs abandoned Clay for the abolitionist Liberty Party and their candidate, James G. Burney of New York. The exodus to the Liberty Party cost Clay 36 electoral votes and the election. After the election, a little-known Whig congressman from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln pined that 
If the Whig abolitionists of New York had voted with us, Mr. Clay would now be president. Clay had run for the office three times in his life. This would be his last attempt. Through his long congressional tenure, Henry Clay had earned the nickname the Great Compromiser, but after the election of 1844, he would forever be labeled with another moniker, the Great Rejected. On December 3rd, the House rescinded the gag rule, opening the floor of Congress to the discussion of abolition and tearing the wound of slavery wide open. On December 4th, Democrat James K. Polk was officially elected as the 11th President of the United States. Out of 2.7 million votes cast, he narrowly defeated Clay by 38,000 votes. It was his pro-annexation stance that likely pushed him over the top. The results of the election revealed a nation deeply divided. 1844 would be the first in a series of elections where no candidate would win a majority of the popular vote, a trend that would not be broken until the election of 1864. Though he did not make a run, John Tyler did not go quietly into the night. He took the victory of Polk as a mandate that the people wanted Texas, and on February 28, 1845, six days before Polk's inauguration, President Tyler solidified his legacy. He circumvented the constitutional requirements for treaty ratification by using a joint resolution of Congress and passed the treaty with a simple majority, making Texas a U.S. territory. In March of 1845, Florida was admitted as the 27th state, a slave state. Texas, too, was admitted in December of 1845, further shifting the power of the country towards the slave-holding South. Tyler soon retired to his Virginia plantation, feeling finally he had succeeded as president. He had won the issue of Texas, and in so doing, he had cost his political rival, Henry Clay, the White House. And at the urging of Andrew Jackson, he had helped give the reins of presidential power to James K. Polk. But as young Hickory ascended to the highest office in the country, old Hickory was holding on for dear life. In June of 1845, on a plantation outside of Nashville, Tennessee, a minister stood above an emaciated man on his deathbed. As the man struggled for each remaining breath, he spoke of his legacy. The minister asked of him, General Jackson, what would you have done as president with Calhoun and the other nullifiers if they had kept on? Would you have fought your own countrymen? Jackson shocked the minister when he replies, I would have hung them, sir, as high as Haman. They should have been a terror to traitors for all time, and posterity would have pronounced it the best act of my life. Andrew Jackson was many things, but above all, he believed in an unbreakable union. On June 8, 1845, he died. Modern historians would say it was the two lead bullets lodged in his body from duels many years past that finally took his life. Light Jackson's old wounds, the unanswered question of slavery would continue to poison the country from within until the very nation would be fighting for its last breath. But in the meantime, 1845 would see the nation unite against a common foe. The annexation of Texas had made an enemy of Mexico and war was coming. Through that conflict, a new general would rise to national fame and political power, General Zachary Taylor, who would go on to command the battlefield and wage another war in the election of 1848. This is episode 15 of American Elections Wicked Game, 1844, His Accidency. On the next episode, the election of 1848, in the wake of war with Mexico, Zachary Taylor and the Whigs get a helping hand from the Three Soilers, a third-party political movement founded in opposition to slavery, a movement that finds an unlikely leader in former President Martin Van Buren. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Elections Wicked Game is an airship production, hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Sound designed by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. Co-executive produced by Stephen Walters in association with Ritual Productions. Written and researched by Eric Archilla. Fact-checking by Greg Jackson and C.L. Salazar from the podcast History That Doesn't Suck.